Hello everyone, this set of notes is going to cover sections 5.4 to 5.6. In 5.3, we left off talking about enantiomers, how to draw them, uh, how to identify them, what are they. Um, now, in section 5.4, we're going to look at how we differentiate um, stereoisomers such as enantiomers through something called optical activity. So chiral compounds will be optically active and um, achiral compounds are not optically active. So chiral equals optically active. And we'll talk about what that means in a moment, where achiral means they are not optically active. So Let's first look at um, one, one set of stereoisomers that we learned about called enantiomers. Enantiomers have similar properties. Notice their melting points and boiling points are the same. They also have similar densities. So how can we physically differentiate between these two? We need a... Uh, a method to differentiate between enantiomers. So we do that because we we need to determine a sample's optical or enantiomeric purity. So the way that we're going to be able to differentiate enantiomers is through the fact that they will rotate plane polarized light in opposite directions. Plane polarized light um, is just a photon of light that has an electric and a magnetic field that are perpendicular to each other. And as that photon or um, electrical field and magnetic field propagate, all right, we get a, a beam of light Chiral compounds are optically active, which means they will rotate this plane polarized light. So we can take advantage of this with a lab technique called polarimetry. And this was in the lab that we did um, before spring break. A polarimeter is the device used to measure optical activity, just like in our lab. Let's take a look at how it works for an achiral versus a chiral compound. Let's start off with a chiral. Your light source passes the light, which in which let's just say let's consider these arrows to be just the electrical fields, right? If you recall, the electrical and magnetic fields are perpendicular to each other. Let's pretend like these arrows are your electrical fields. And these electrical fields are, pr are propagating in all different directions. That light gets passed through a polarizer, which then gives us our plain polarized light, which means all of the electrical fields are aligned in one direction. So that light passes through a sample tube containing our uh, compound. And then if the light is rotated, will detect it. And for an achiral compound, you can see that the electrical field has not been rotated. So no rotation of the light. That's how we tell that it's achiral. So it would give you a reading of zero degrees. The angle of rotation would be zero. For a chiral compound, the same thing, the light goes through the polarizer. The plain polarized light passes through the sample tube containing your compound. And then if it's chiral, that light will be rotated um, to a certain degree, either to the left or to the right, into the plus or to the minus direction. So we have rotation here which can be measured. If a rotation occurs, then you have an optically active compound. 
Now, there are a few caveats here. If there's no rotation, that could indicate that you have one of two things. You could have an achiral compound, or you could have a 50-50 mixture of enantiomers, which is called a racemic mixture. So if your rotation is zero, it could be one of two things. It could be an achiral compound, or it could be a racemic mixture of enantiomers, which in that case, the rotations would cancel each other out. All right. So that rotation that we just talked about, um, we can use to calculate something called the specific rotation. Now, enantiomers will rotate light to an equal in magnitude, but opposite in direction. Equal degrees, but opposite in direction. The degree to which the light gets rotated depends on a couple things. It depends on the sample concentration and the path length of the light. So the specific rotation is a calculated value. It is the observed rotation that comes out of the instrument That's your angle, observed rotation. This is your concentration in grams per milliliter. Um, and this is your path length in decimeters. If the sample is neat, meaning that it's not dissolved in a solvent, then you can use density in place of concentration. So. It, so you would just plug in your density here, which also has units of grams per milliliter. If we take two enantiomers, these are enantiomers. And we measure their rotations and calculate the specific rotations. We get calculated values of minus 23.1 for the R and positive 23.1 for the S. R and S do not tell us plus or minus. So in this case, R does not mean minus. That just happens to be what it is. S does not always mean that it's plus. So it's a calculated value. You could have something that has an S configuration that has a minus specific rotation. The plus and minus simply tell us the direction that the light is rotated. Now, um, we're not going to see this too often in our book, but dextro and levo rotatory, this is usually used for uh, amino acids and, and carbohydrates. So dextro rotatory is D. That means it's just a positive direction. Levo rotatory um, has a negative rotation. These are typically used for, like I said, amino acids and carbohydrates. So um, let's look at an example of calculating specific rotation. So you have three grams of sucrose and 10 mils of water. The sample cell is 10 centimeters in length, and the observed rotation from the machine is plus 1.99 degrees. So your specific rotation is going to be equal to, if you recall, the observed over your concentration times the path cell length. So the observed rotation is your positive 1.99 degrees. The concentration has to be Remember, concentration is grams per milliliter. So if we plug that in, that's 3 grams over 10 milliliters. And we're going to multiply that by the path cell length in, um, in decimeters. Now the conversion, the quick conversion, 10 centimeters equals 1 decimeter. So our sample length path cell length was 10 centimeters, so that's one decimeter. And you can calculate that and you get positive 66.3 uh, degrees for your specific rotation.
if a sample has a mixture of enantiomers that is not 50-50, if you have more of one enantiomer than another, then we say that that solution is um, not enantiomerically pure. If you have a solution or a sample that contains only one single enantiomer, we say that it is optically pure. It contains a single enantiomer. And if you recall, a racemic mixture just means a 50-50 mixture of enantiomers. So for unequal amounts of enantiomers, we can calculate something called the enantiomeric excess. And we determine that from the specific or calculated rotation. So observed just means experimental. But specific means it's the calculated. So you would take your calculated specific rotation and then you would divide it by the calculated literature value for the, this would be the literature value for the pure enantiomer. Times by 100, you get your percent enantiomeric excess, or percent EE. So for example, if we have a mixture and we have a specific rotation of 4.6, we want to calculate the percent EE for the ratio of R to S. These are the two um, enantiomers in the mixture. And these are the literature values. Notice that their rotations are equal in magnitude but opposite in direction. Okay, so if the calculated specific rotation was 4.6 and it was positive, so that means that our mixture has more of the um, positive rotation in antimer. So we put that one on the bottom. And times it by 100, and you get 20% EE. I think I forgot to write times 100 here, but it's implied using this equation. Section 5.5, stereoisomeric relationships. We're going to look at enantiomers and diastereomers and learn how to draw um, all the enantiomers and diastereomers for a given compound. So let's just look at how we break down isomers. The first type of isomer we learned was a constitutional isomer. They have same molecular formula, different connectivity. And we said, all right, well, now we have something called stereoisomers. They have the same connectivity. They have the um, same molecular formula, but they have a different spatial arrangement of the atoms in space. Uh, so these stereoisomers, we can say, are non-superimposable on each other. Now, there are two types of stereoisomers, enantiomers and diastereomers. We've already talked about enantiomers but we're going to introduce diastereomers. Enantiomers happen to be mirror images of each other, but they're non-superimposable. They have similar properties, um, and we can differentiate these through optical rotation or polarimetry. Diastereomers, on the other hand, are not mirror images of each other. They have multiple chiral centers. Um, they're not mirror images, and they have different physical properties. They'll have different densities, different boiling points, different melting points. The first example of diastereomers are going to be our cis-trans isomers. So cis-trans alkenes Remember, we, we said that they are stereoisomers in section 5.1, and we talked about them in 5.2. Um, cis-trans alkenes are stereoisomers. Well, 
Now we know there are two types of stereoisomers, enantiomers and diastereomers. These are diastereomers. So when you see cis-trans alkenes, I say, what is the relationship meaning are they enantiomers, are they constitutional isomers, are they diastereomers, are they the same compound, meaning they're identical? The answer would be they're diastereomers. Uh, cis-trans cycloalkanes are diastereomers. Trans versus cis. The relationship between these is that they are diastereomers, not enantiomers. Enantiomers would mean both the stereocenters are flipped. This has an example of just one being flipped. So neither of these are mirror images of each other. So cis is not a mirror image of trans in either case. So diastereomers, remember, are not mirror images where enantiomers are. Okay, so if you recall, we talked about calculating the number of stereoisomers in a molecule um, equaling 2 to the n power, where n equals the number of chiral centers or chiral carbons. Okay, the first skill that we need to be able to do in this section is we need to draw all possible stereoisomers for a molecule. So in the first example, let's draw all the possible stereoisomeric uh, forms of the given molecule, and then we're going to identify the relationship between each of them. So let's first calculate how many we should get. Well, we have one, two stereocenters. So two to the second power equals four. We should find four stereo isomers and identify their relationships. So it doesn't matter which one you start with. As drawn, this is not indicating any stereochemistry. <clears throat> so we're going to just start, pick some place to start. It doesn't matter. I'm going to make both of the chlorines a wedge. All right, so I think the first thing we learned was how to draw the enantiomer. So let's draw the enantiomer. Remember, to draw an enantiomer, you just flip both or all of the chiral centers. So in the first example, they were wedges. We're going to flip them both to be dashes. Those are the enantiomers. All right, so let's pick one diastereomer to draw. Here's the trick for drawing a diastereomer. You hold one stereocenter the same. I'm going to keep this first chiral center the same. And then you flip the other one. You see, I flipped this one and I kept this one the same. So that's how you draw a diastereomer. For an enantiomer, you flip all of the wedges to dashes or dashes to wedges. For a diastereomer, you just flip one at a time. So the relationship between these two is that they are diastereomers. And they are not mirror images. All right, well, let's take the diastereomer that we just drew and let's draw its enantiomer. All right, well, we know that to draw an enantiomer, we're just going to turn all the wedges to dashes and all the dashes to wedges. So we start with our first one. It was a wedge. Let's make it a dash. 
And with the second one, it was a dash, let's make it a wedge. So these are enantiomers. All right, so what is the relationship between these two compounds? Well, we didn't flip both stereocenters. One is the same, and the other one has flipped. So these are diastereomers. All right, in the next example, let's draw all possible stereoisomers for the following uh, and identify their relationship. So we're going to start with this compound that has wedges and dashes. <clears throat> and I want to point out some important points here. Um, so let's start with... That's a wedge. All right, so it's telling us that carbon one is an R and carbon two is an S. Well, let's first calculate the number of stereoisomers that can be drawn. I have two chiral carbons, so two to the n equals four. So there are four total stereoisomers. Let's first draw the enantiomer. We're gonna flip both stereocenters. They were both wedges, now we're gonna make them both dashes. All right, so these are enantiomers. And if the carbon one was an R and we flip it, it becomes an S. And if carbon two was an S and we flip it, it becomes an R. Notice how the configuration changes when I change it from a wedge to a dash um, and vice versa from a dash to a wedge. What you don't want to think is that R equals a wedge and S equals a dash, that is incorrect. Remember, absolute configurations have to be determined using the kahn engel prelog system that we discussed in the last set of notes. All right, so we've just assigned, um, or we've just drawn the enantiomer. Let's go ahead and draw a diastereomer. You can keep one stereocenter the same. Let's keep this one the same. That was an R. And we're going to flip carbon number two. The methyl is a wedge. We're going to flip it to a dash. And if we flip our wedge to a dash, then the configuration also changes. So now they're both R. Let's go ahead and draw the enantiomer of this. Oh, these were diastereomers. And if we want to draw the enantiomer, remember we just flip both chiral carbons. All right, so the wedge becomes a dash and the dash becomes a wedge. So if carbon one was an R and we flip it, it now becomes an S. And in carbon two, if it was an R, it now becomes an S. Those were the enantiomers. For enantiomers, you just flip everything. Configuration flips. And wedges go to dashes, and dashes go to wedges. You do it for all of them. So what would the relationship between my top and bottom compounds be? 
These are diastereomers. Why? Because to get from the bottom to the top, I hold one stereo center the same, and I flipped the other one. In this case, I held number carbon one with the OH group the same, and I flipped the methyl from a wedge to a dash. In this last section, we're going to discuss symmetry and chirality. So um, I posted a meso compound tutorial in the supplemental materials folder. Uh, and there's a subfolder chapter five in there on Blackboard. You can check that out. I feel like it's a little bit more straightforward than uh, the book, but that's really up to you. If you understand uh, from your reading, then you don't need to go to the, um, the tutorial. It's just an extra reading. All right, so the important skills for this section are, number one, understand what a meso compound is. Two, be able to uh, identify if a compound is a meso compound or not. And then three, identi identify whether a compound is chiral or achiral using uh, a set of criteria. First, let's talk about what a meso compound is. A meso compound is a molecule that has multiple chiral centers. It needs to be an even number of chiral centers and it must have a plane of symmetry. Um, although meso compounds do have chiral centers, they are achiral. This is really important. They are achiral because they will not rotate plane polarized light. The plane of symmetry causes the chiral centers uh, the rotation about the chiral centers to sort of cancel out, almost like uh, a racemic mixture of enantiomers. Okay, so here's the criteria to determine if a compound is meso. It must have an even number of chiral centers, it must have an internal mirror plane, and both halves um, are symmetrical about that mirror plane. So let's look at some examples. In the first one, we have one, two chiral centers. So check, that's criteria number one. Number two, does it have a mirror plane? So can we draw, imagine drawing a mirror plane of symmetry. So it does have a mirror plane. And three, are both halves of the mirror plane symmetrical? Do they match up? So they do. So this is a meso compound. And we say that it's achiral. So it will not ro rotate plane polarized light. It would give you zero rotation um, on a polarimeter. Let's look at the next one. We have two chiral centers. We have a mirror plane. And if we look at both sides, right, we have to ask ourselves, are both sides or both halves symmetrical? Do they match? And the answer is yes. So we say that this compound is a meso compound. Therefore, it is achiral. And the last one. Criteria one, it has two, that's an even number of chiral centers. Um, next, we're looking for a mirror plane, an internal mirror plane. So there's our internal mirror plane. And three, do both halves match? Yes, they do. So it's a meso compound. Therefore, it is a chiral. All right, let's talk about chiral versus achiral. Um, chiral molecules will rotate plane polarized light, and that means they are optically active. Achiral molecules will not rotate plane polarized light, and we say they are optically inactive or not optically active. So let's look at the characteristics of chiral molecules. Chiral molecules have, may have just one chiral center 
or if they have multiple chiral centers, then um, they cannot be meso. So in our first example, we have one chiral center. All right, and it's definitely not meso. It doesn't fit the criteria for meso, so we say it's chiral. Let's look at the second one. This is one where we have multiple chiral centers, one, two, but this is not meso. Why? Because look at that mirror plane. We can draw that plane of symmetry there, and the halves don't match. So it's not meso. Therefore, it's a chiral compound, and it will rotate plane polarized light. A chiral molecules, on the other hand, can be one of two scenarios. They can have either no chiral centers, like our first example, that is not a chiral center, right? Because we've got a hydrogen in the back, a CH3 and a CH3. To be a chiral carbon, you have to have four different things attached. So that is not a chiral carbon. Therefore, this is a chiral. And it's not meso either. Um, and for the next one, we have two chiral carbons. However, now if we have chiral centers, we have to check to see if it's meso. We have this internal plane of symmetry. Both halves match. Therefore, it's a meso compound. And it is a chiral. In our last example here, we're going to look at several different molecules. We're going to identify if it's chiral or achiral, and we want to identify if it's meso or not meso. So for our first example, let's think about the criteria. Let's, let's go through and identify if these are meso first. Um, for the first one, a meso compound can only have our meso compound must have multiple chiral centers and it has to be an even number. This has one chiral center, so it's not meso. Now, in order to be chiral, it just has to have a chiral carbon. So it does have one chiral carbon. So we say that this is a chiral molecule. Let's look at the next one. We have one two chiral carbons all right we have to check is it, if it's meso or not if we want to identify it as chiral or achiral so um, in order to be meso you have to have a plane of symmetry well i don't really see a mirror plane of symmetry with both halves matching up here so it's not meso and because it has multiple chiral carbons and it is not meso, we say that it is a chiral molecule. For the next one, we've got one, two chiral carbons. Um, and we're going to check to see if it's meso. Well, let's draw our mirror plane. Those halves do not match up. They're not mirror images of each other. Okay, so it's definitely not meso. And if it has multiple chiral centers and it's not meso, we say that it's chiral, just like the last example. All right, let's look at our fourth example. We have one, two chiral carbons. We see a plane of symmetry with both halves matching up. So this is a meso compound. And we know that meso compounds are a chiral. They will not rotate plane polarized light. In the fifth example, we have a molecule that has no chiral carbons. If it doesn't have any chiral carbons, it cannot be chirals. Therefore, this is a chiral and it is definitely not a meso compound. In the sixth example, we have four chiral centers. It is an even number. So we're going to look for 
an internal plane, mirror plane. And it turns out both halves of our internal mirror plane are symmetrical or they match up. So this is a meso compound. And we know that meso compounds are a chiral. Let's look at our next example. We have one chiral carbon, therefore it cannot be meso. If it has one chiral carbon, then we say that the molecule is chiral, just like our first example. In, this, in the next one, I see two chiral carbons. We have a mirror plane of symmetry, and both halves match up. So this is considered a meso compound, and all meso compounds are a chiral. In the last one, well, it, it kind of looks like that's a chiral carbon, but technically it's not because we have a hydrogen, a CH3. Now look, go around both sides of the ring. Isn't that an identical path going around both sides? So there are no stereocenters in this last example. That is not a chiral carbon. So this molecule is a chiral and it is definitely not a meso compound. All right, and that concludes this example.